I thought uh, in these midweeks that I would preach through the book of Matthew. Um, I thought because on Sundays we normally go through uh, topics that I've never really preached through a book at our church and, and because we're always preaching through topics we're jumping all over the Bible and I thought it'd be nice for us to go through one of the Gospels so that we can focus our, um, you know, our extra meetings on the life of Jesus Christ. So I don't know how long it'll take me to go through this, but I, I won't try and preach on it too in depth, but you know, it's not going to be necessarily one chapter each time we meet, but just pulling a few thoughts uh, from the book of Matthew as we go through it. So I wanted to just preach today uh, just on this genealogy from Matthew chapter 1, from 1 to 17. So we'll just start by reading the portion of scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharaohs and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaohs begat Ezron, and Ezron begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasson, and Naasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa. And Asa begat jo Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. And Ozias begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias. And Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Am Amon, and Amon begat Josias. And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor. And Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So just a few points from this portion of scripture. I know genealogies are often the portions of the Bible that we tend to skip over. And I'm sure we've all done it. I've, I've been guilty of it as well. You know, we're reading through the Bible and you, you see a genealogy and you just start skipping through it, you know, because it, they're not the most exciting parts of the Bible. But what, what I want you to notice um, about genealogies is that you can learn a lot from genealogies. You know, you can learn um, who's related to who. Now, I only just was reading a genealogy recently and I realized that Bezalel, who was the guy that um, built a lot of the things in the temple, he was actually the great-grandson of Caleb. You know, Caleb was one of, the, uh, one of the 12 spies with Joshua when they went into the land and they were of the two, you know, Joshua and Caleb that said, hey, yeah, we can go in and we can actually overcome it. So you can see there that he actually descended from somebody very righteous. So you learn these things by looking at um, uh, these different relationships and who's, uh, who's related to who, and you can get, you get an idea of the timeline and things like that, of where people sit uh, in these genealogies. Uh, one thing you'll notice as well is you might be thinking, you know, why in the New Testament and in the Old Testament you have, for example, uh, Jeconias there or Josias, and you have Josiah in the Old Testament and Jeconiah in the Old Testament. The names are slightly different. And the way I've always understood this and the way it's been taught to me as well is because in the Old Testament we're coming from a different language, we're coming from the Hebrew language, and in the New Testament it's from the Greek, so the, 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 I guess the transliterations to the English are slightly different in the uh, English as they are in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. Now one other point I want to talk about with the genealogies is one reason why uh, the, the genealogies are important in the Bible is because it actually shows that Jesus Christ descended from real people. Now I know before I was saved, I always thought that Jesus Christ was just a fairy tale, you know, just a myth, just a story that people made up. And when it comes to like, say for example, Mormonism, it is a myth, you know, it is a, it is a fairy tale because they, there, there is no actual history, you know, going back to back up Mormonism. Whereas in the Bible, we have 
uh, a genealogy going back even in Luke we see it go back all the way to Adam which shows that these are actually real people real stories and they have real descendants which are actually traced in these genealogies in the Bible um, and like I said in Luke it can be traced back all the way even to the beginning of creation now Everybody has different teachings on why these different uh, genealogies are important. I know I've, I've heard before that this genealogy traces the kingly line of Jesus Christ. But what, uh, through, a couple of things I wanted to point out with this genealogy is, is what do I think is, is significant here? Now what I think is significant about this genealogy in Matthew 1 is in verse 17 it says, it, it mentions three events that are all separated by 14 generations right so you have the first one is Abraham so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations and then you've got from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations and then from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations now what's the significance of Abraham David and then the carrying away to Babylon and then ultimately the coming of our the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ well what I think is interesting about this is that these are, these are three events which Jesus actually fulfilled. So we'll just look at these uh, one by one. We'll just first of all go to Genesis. Genesis 12, 7. And obviously this is the pr first prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled, which was the promise to Abraham to be uh, the promised seed. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him so there was a promise given to Abraham. there's many promises given to Abraham and obviously uh, they applied also to Isaac in this instance but we know that these apply to Jesus Christ because when we go to Galatians 3 16 we see here that this seed that was to come was not Isaac that the promises were given to it was actually Jesus Christ who was the seed that fulfilled this prophecy now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made now look at this he saith not and to seeds as of, a, as of many. So you see how the promise that was given to Abraham was not given to his physical descendants. It wasn't to his seed as in a multitude of people. It was referring to one particular person who was to come. And that's why he makes the distinction there between many seeds as opposed to one seed. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So we see here that that's the first one, Abraham in those three events that are mentioned. The next one is David, where the son of David is prophesied to come. And, and that genealogy points out that event too, where Jesus Christ is not only descended from Abraham, Abraham, he fulfills that covenant and that um, so that prophecy, but also uh, the prophecy given to David that Jesus Christ would be the son of David. So let's go to 2 Samuel 7, and it's in Chronicles as well, but we're just going to go to this one because they kind of say the same thing. But this was a prophecy that was told to David, and I believe it's a prophecy that David actually misunderstood. Um, in the sense that, that he thought that it was referring to Solomon, his son, as opposed to Jesus Christ, who would come and would fulfill that prophecy of being the son of David. It says here in our verses, we're going to read from verses 12 to 14. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So there's this promise to David that he, would, um, that he would have a son that would build his house. So if you remember, David it was in his heart because God had only originally set up a tabernacle, right? So there was a temporary dwelling place. And then David wanted to build a permanent dwelling place um, for God. And he actually, you know, Nathan, first of all, you know the story. He went to Nathan. Nathan said, hey, go and do it. That's all that's in your heart. And then God comes to Nathan and says, no, 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 David's not going to build my house. You know, I'm going to build him a house. Um, and and he, he talks about there's going to be the seed that comes after you. He's going to build a house for my name. 
Now we go to, um, uh, uh, maybe it's First Chronicles. Maybe that's why I have this reference here. I wanted to show you. <laughs> uh, kind of all the words. Uh, here we go. So in, uh, I want to show you here that Matthew, in Matthew 22, 41, that's, that's the parallel passage that I had in here. Well, we see here, David, uh, Jesus Christ actually fulfilled this prophesy, prophecy because he is known as the son of David that was coming. So it says, while the, prophecies were uh, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. So see, people recognize that the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, was known as the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So he was sort of throwing them a curveball there, because uh, the son of David in the Old Testament, you know, David refers to this coming Messiah as his Lord, and they're saying, well, if he's the Lord of David, how can he be his son? Well, it's because he's both, right? Because he's the root and the offspring of David. Now, the reason why I think David misunderstood this passage, so in uh, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 2, we see here David, um, what I believe is David's understanding of what God said to him. So we have two passages, one in 2 Samuel, I'm not going to read the one in 1 Chronicles 17, where God says, no, you're not going to build me a house. Your son, I'm going to raise up a, your seed after you. He's going to build me a house. But look at David reflecting on this and what he's uh, saying here and how I, how I think he misunderstood what God was saying to him. Uh, he says, Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. So this is David. He's saying, hey, this was my... This is my desire to do this for God. Look at this. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name. Look at this. Because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Now, if we look at the passages back where God actually came to David and said, You're not going to build me a house. The reason why I think this is David misinterpreting what God said to him is because God never said this to him. God never said to him, The reason why you're not going to build me a house is because you're a man of bloodshed. I think this is how David understood it. David uh, thought, hey, maybe this is why God doesn't want me to build the house. He wants Solomon to build the house. Thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler and of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons. Look at this. He chose Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, look at this, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. So you notice there that when um, God comes to David and says, no, I'm going to raise up a seat. He's going to build my house. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. He didn't mention who it was going to be. And then David here, I believe, is interpreting what God said to him as, well, the reason why God doesn't want me to build it is because I'm a man of war. And since Solomon is raised up in my stead, he must be talking about Solomon. Therefore, he's going to use Solomon to build the house. Um, and that's why I think uh, this played out. So I don't believe God ever intended to build the temple. Now, he did uh, eventually bless it, you know, because he used it as a picture of things to come. Um, just like he never intended a king. You remember, God never intended Israel to have a king, but the people of Israel wanted a king. And he still uses the picture of the king as his, he's a king over us. So I think he still uses that analogy in the New Testament in the sense that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and how the temple was you know, arrayed with gold and we're meant to be clean and beautiful and things like that. Um, but I don't think it was something that God intended. And that's what he actually said to David. Uh, if you go back and read in 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles that he says, you know, did I ever command anyone to build a temple? You know, I built a tabernacle. Uh, it was meant to be a temporary dwelling place because the real temple of God is in heaven and that's the, the heavenly temple that is permanent. Uh, that's a bit of a longer point. So, so remember in, in Matthew, we're talking about the three events. So uh, Abraham, uh, he, was, uh, he was the seed that was to come. Same, he was the son of David, so he fulfilled that one. And the last one uh, I thought about is... Uh, when it says uh, it was the carrying away into Babylon. 
So that was the event where the, when, when the people of God were taken captive, right? And what did Jesus do when he came? He set at liberty the captives. So that's an, another thing that he fulfilled. And that's why I think there's these significant, event, significant events that are mentioned here. And we'll just go here in Isaiah. This is the, the prophecy in the Old Testament uh, where Jesus actually uh, fulfills this. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Look at this. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, what's so interesting about this passage in the New Testament in Luke 4, uh, here in 18, <clears throat> says here, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Look at this, and as his custom was. So we see here that Jesus as well, even growing up as a man, before he was sent into all the world to preach, and he started his ministry when he was baptized and everything like that, or after, after he had baptized, because that was in... In Luke 3. Um, but we see here, even before that, the Bible says here, as his custom was, so he was somebody that was actually involved, you know, with the, with the ongoings of the temple. You know, we, it's like, you know, if we're going to follow that example, we ought to be somebody that is involved in, uh, you know, the, the ministry of the church, right, and the things that happen. So it says here, as his custom was. So one of the things that Jesus did and what his custom was is he was the Bible reader, if you think about it. He got up and he read the scriptures. Uh, when they got together at the synagogue. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. So this is uh, Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So we just read this passage in Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So you see how one of those things in there was to preach deliverance to the captives, right? To set at liberty the captives. Look at this in verse 20. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Look what he says here. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words, words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? So they recognized in Isaiah 61 that the Messiah was coming, right? To, to set at liberty the captives. And Jesus, as his custom was, stands up in the synagogue, right? He reads the passage and imagine, just imagine the, the atmosphere in that place where he says, you know, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears right or he, he, what did he say this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears basically saying hey he is the messiah that is coming so let's just go back to matthew really quick uh, matthew 1 17. so that's why i believe these events are, are mentioned here they're all very significant events one is you know he's a descendant of abraham because he was the prophesied seed that the promises were made to um, he's a descent he's the son of david which was the prophesied king that would come that would build the house of god and then he's also the prophesied savior right who would set at liberty god's people who are taken captive you know obviously saving us from our sins and then the 14 years to christ is when that is actually fulfilled now the last thing i just wanted to point out here as well is you'll notice in the in the genealogy here it says in jacob verse 16 jacob begat joseph the husband of mary of whom was born jesus so what i think is interesting is that the genealogy goes through joseph even though joseph wasn't jesus's biological father right it went through so so jesus was born of mary and and he and he was the son of god because god was his god was his father but it's interesting that the genealogy goes through what I understand is his adopted father, you know, and the fact that he's his adopted son because it wasn't actually his biological son. So what I think is interesting that even though these promises are made for this son, this seed to come, the genealogy goes through an adopted genealogy at, at Jacob. And, and what I, the thought I had there is, you know, that even as adopted sons, they still receive that inheritance just like we do. You know, we receive an inheritance even though we one day will be adopted, right? We, we're waiting um, for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So physically, we are adopted sons. We get to take part in this inheritance. Um, so 
I don't know if that's exactly what it means, but that's what I was thinking that, you know, he didn't actually, he was not actually a seed uh, of Joseph because he was born of God. But even though um, he was adopted as, uh, as, as a man under Joseph, you know, the, the, the inheritance and the seed and the promises still apply to him. And I just wanted to show you here in Ephesians 1 verse 3, where it's the same with us. And I think it's something to be really thankful for. Um, it says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. Now, this is not teaching Calvinism. I'm not going to get into the whole doctrine of Calvinism tonight, but this is not teaching Calvinism. What, he, what his teaching is before the world began, he has preordained certain things. According as, as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, so he didn't choose us to salvation. What he did choose is that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Look at this. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So before the world began, God knew who was going to get saved and he already predestined a plan that these people that would be saved would be adopted and to be his children to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to, the good, to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, look at this, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So I just thought, it, I just thought I'd point that out. I don't know if that's necessarily what it means, but when I saw you know, Joseph being included in that genealogy, and even though Joseph was not the biological father, it's interesting that the inheritance still goes through that genealogy even though Jesus Christ is, in a sense, an adopted son of Joseph. And like we are adopted sons of the Lord, we also have that, uh, that privilege to be able to inherit things with Jesus Christ. Anyways, I hope you, you learned a, a little bit there. And uh, next time we meet, we'll, uh, we'll go on to the birth of Jesus Christ uh, um, and in the next half of uh, Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. All right, let's pray and then um, we'll sing a song and then we'll, we'll break up for a prayer. All right, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and thank you that through him we, we have an inheritance. We're, we're your adopted sons. We thank you, Lord, that he not only came to die for our sins, but you know, how that he died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That, uh, Lord, we have a miraculous Savior that came and fulfilled these, all these Old Testament prophecies and fulfilled being the seed of Abraham, the son of David and, and the saviour of those that are captive in coming and being incarnate in the flesh for us. Thank you, Lord. Um, and, we, and we pray that you'll just bless the rest of our time here. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.